O Father which art in heaven, we beg you for your Holy Spirit. We can do nothing without Jesus. Lord, we need you like we've never needed you before. And so we ask that as we open your word that you would come and tabernacle with us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, brothers and sisters. You know, I look forward to our time together. What do you say? I'm enjoying studying the Word of God with you. And my brothers and sisters, tonight as we continue in our series, Wake Up, Time is Running Out, I believe that we can begin to see that time is indeed running out. Am I right or wrong? And if ever there was a time we need Jesus, I believe that we can see we need Him right now. In fact, would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, the second chapter. We're going to Matthew chapter 2. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Now, I told you every night I was going to ask you something. You remember that? Tonight, was it hard for you to get here tonight? Someone says no. Someone says yes. I promise you, before it's over, it's going to be hard for every one of us to be able to make it. The devil is afraid of what we're studying. He doesn't want you and I to get this relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, my brothers and sisters, you've got to make it up in your mind, nothing is going to stop me from giving my all to Jesus Christ. Nothing is going to stop me night by night as we make this decision to follow Jesus. Amen? Now, I'm going to introduce to us a challenge uh, tonight that I'm going to encourage each one of us to do. I hear that in Barry, uh, Canada, that you like challenges, and so I don't want to let you down. I want to give you a challenge. Amen? You sound very excited about that challenge. Don't, don't be too afraid. It's not going to be a hard challenge. I'm going to challenge us to go three nights with no television. Three nights with no what? Television. And what television I mean by that? I mean three nights of no screens, nothing that we're looking at, just looking at recreational things. Three nights of no television. Three nights of looking at no YouTube videos or no YouTube documentaries. Three nights simply of no screen. Can you do that? I'm going to challenge you with that tonight. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If you cannot do that, you will never be ready for the coming of Jesus. I can promise you that no one that is addicted to television or to YouTube or to Netflix or to any screen will ever be ready for the coming of the Lord. I promise you that. And so what we're doing is a little challenge for the next three days. Three days of no television, no screens, no looking at the things of this world and entertainment. Three days of doing that. That means it will take us from tonight. I'm going to give you tonight. I'm going to give you tonight. Now you're here most of the time. I'm going to give you tonight. So that will take us from what night? That will take us from what? Monday night, Tuesday night, and then what? Wednesday night. So when we come back on Wednesday night, I'm going to check and see how we did with that challenge. And I know that I'm going to be able to tell, you know, tomorrow... I'm going to look at you and I'm going to tell if you took the challenge. See, when a man is addicted to something, man has cocaine, he's addicted to cocaine. If he doesn't get his fix, he's shaking. <laughs> I'm going to watch you when you come in tomorrow night. And if I notice you're shaking, I know you took the challenge. It's almost like now that the screens and the cell phones have become a part of the human anatomy. Everywhere we go, it goes with us. And God is trying to help us to understand that we need something more than those screens and those cell phones and those devices. What we need is Jesus. Do you know that if we treated Jesus the way we treat our devices, we would be ready for the coming of the Lord? Did you know that? And when we wake up, first thing, man reaches for his cell phone. He charges his cell phone. I mean, can you imagine if we reach for Jesus? If that was the first thing we did, last thing we did, all throughout the day, we're scrolling, checking this and that. Can you imagine if we were dealing with Jesus like that? We would know him as a close, intimate, and personal friend. The problem is we don't give Jesus enough time. It takes time. Am I right or wrong? Now, in order to be ready for the coming of the Lord, we are now take the challenge three nights of no what? No screens, no television. I, I say it again and again because I want you to even go to sleep and remember what I tell you. If you pass by the television, I want that big screen to say, don't look at me. Now, just listen to this now. Listen to this now. Just listen. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means each of us 
are going to have some challenges this week. And if we'll do that, by the grace of God, then we'll be all right. Amen? Now, we found out as we studied together that the greatest thing we need in the last days, we can sum it up. What is the greatest thing that we need in the last days? Talk to me, somebody. What is the greatest thing we need? I heard somebody right on the point. We need a relationship with Jesus where we know him as a what? As a what? Close. What else? Intimate. And what else? Personal friend. We must know God as a friend. That is what's going to take us through what's coming. No amount of anything else. You know, revival is only good enough if it brings us into a relationship with Jesus. You know, the Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Though a man were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus is the resurrection. You know, we can't get revival without Jesus. And we can't get reformation without Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are what? Passed away and all things become new. Revival and reformation center in one man whose name is Jesus. And if we get that friendship with him, with Jesus, then we can go through what's coming. And this is why we're studying this week. We want to know how to get to know him as a close, intimate, and personal friend. Now, this week I've given uh, given us a three-step plan. Am I right? I've given us a three-step plan talking about this very thing. A three-step plan. Now, before we go through those three steps, foundationally, I gave you three, uh, a three-word phrase, phrase that will remind us one of the main things we have to do if we're going to get to know God. What is the three phrase? The three-word phrase. Now, what is the three-word phrase? It takes time. We should never forget that. One of the greatest things that God tells us is that if we're going to get to know him, it's going to take our time. And if we're not willing to give him our time, we're not really, really ready to get to know Jesus. And I'm going I'm to be honest with you. If we know Jesus, we have nothing to be afraid of or what's coming. But I'm going to tell you this. If a man doesn't know Jesus and he's not afraid, he's a fool. Let me repeat that. If a man is not afraid of the time in which we live and he doesn't know Jesus, he's a fool. A foolish virgin. You see, my brother and sister, the Bible says in the last days that fearfulness will surprise the hypocrite. You see, the only thing that should drive fear out of us is a relationship with Christ. The Bible says perfect love does what? Casteth out fear. Well, what if I don't love? Then I should be afraid. You see, my brothers and sisters, what stops fear is a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says a friend loveth at all times. If we love Jesus, nothing to be afraid of. But you know, the majority of the world, we don't love Jesus. The majority of the world love the world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot love the world and love Jesus at the same time. And if we don't love God, we cannot be his friend because a friend loves. And whoever loves God knows God. And whosoever knoweth, loveth not, knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. And so my brothers and sisters, it takes time. And every night as you come here, you know what you're giving God? You're giving him what? Time. When you wake up in the morning and you open your Bible and you pray on your knees, you're giving God time. When you stop throughout the day, when everyone else is distracted by this and that, you're giving God time. And when you give God time, you're giving him your life. I want to give my life to Jesus. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, we found a three-step plan. What was the three-step plan? Talk to me. What was the three-step plan? If we want to get to know God and give him our time, what should we start doing with our time? Number one, what should we start doing? Knowing and what? Understanding that time. Number two, what's the next thing? Let me back that up. Let me back that up. What's What's the second thing? Is there a relationship between knowing the time and knowing what to do? The Bible says to everything, there's a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. Time regulates everything we do. If we know and understand the time, then we would know what to do in that time. Is that in the Bible, yes or no? What text in the Bible tells us, tells us those two things? What text in the Bible tells us that? First Chronicles chapter what? 12 and verse what? Praise God. You sound like you've been studying this week. Praise God. Number three, what's the third thing? Once we know what to do, what if by the grace of God, we do what God says? What is the result of by his grace doing what God says in these last days? What happens? We become his friend. Did Jesus say so? Yes or no? What verse in the Bible? What verse in the Bible tells us that? 
John 15 and verse 14. Praise God. And so we saw that the first thing that sets up this experience of getting to know God as a friend is to know and understand the, the time. When Jesus came preaching on the earth, what was the first thing he said when he started preaching to the people of his day? What did he say? The time is fulfilled. And so my brothers and sisters, if we follow Jesus, we see that all of this is set in motion by understanding the time. Do you want to understand the time? Do you think that we're living in any ordinary time right now? Yes or no? This is no ordinary time. Now, my brother and sister, I want to put something up here. Go in your Bible to Matthew uh, chapter 2. We talked about uh, yesterday those thinking men. Remember that? I want you to know this quotation as it were. I'm, I want to read it so much that you know it from memory. In the book Education, page 179 and 180, I want us to read this together. Father, please anoint your words if we have opened it. For we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read this together. It says, the present is a time of what? Overwhelming interest, not to some people, but to how many? To how many? All living. Rulers and statesmen, that's the leaders of this world. Men who occupy positions of trust and authority. What type of men are these? Thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events that are taking place about us. Are we seeing events taking place about us right now? What is an event that happened Saturday night that the thinking men and women are thinking about? What event happened Saturday night that just passed? What event happened? The bombing of Israel. Over 300 bombs let off in Israel and the world looked at that and they're afraid because they're thinking, could this bring us into another worldwide crisis? You know that a bombing, a direct bombing on Israel like this has never taken place since 1979. And the world is, is wondering, what does it mean? My brothers and sisters, we have been told that this means something to us. It says that, that they have their, that the thinking men have their attention fixed upon these events. They are watching the what? Strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. Are the nations straining in their relationship? Yes or no? You look at what's going on in Russia right now, in India right now, in China right now, in America right now. The relationships have been strained. It says they observe that the intensity that is taking possession of how much? of every earthly element that means no matter which way you turn you can look at any field of knowledge any element of human history and human knowledge and we can see that a crisis is coming it says that these thinking men recognize that something great and decisive is not far away these thinking men know that it's what talk to me somebody about to take place what does that mean when it says about to take place what does that mean it's close to take place right now, about to happen. It says that the, not just America, not just Russia, not just China, but that the world. Now, if I were to say world, give, give me another name for saying world. Earth, give me another name. Global. It says that the world is on the verge of a stupendous what? Crisis. So then the thinking men and women can look at the conditions that exist on the earth on every condition that exists on the earth and recognize that we're in a global crisis. Is that the case right now? Yes or no? The thinking men and women of this world that they're looking at this, they do that. Now look what this says. If we are nearing the limit, what should we see developing in the world? If we're nearing the limit, what should we see developing in this world? I just told you, I want to make sure you're listening. What should we see developing in the world? A global crisis. Now my brothers and sisters, the thinking men, I want to ask you a question. Someone says, well, that's what the prophet said. Does the Bible say the same thing, yes or no? How do I know the Bible says the same thing? Remember at the first coming of Christ? Remember the first coming of Christ? At the first coming of Christ, did some people know that some great event was about to take place before uh, Jesus came that first time? Did they know that, yes or no? What were these men called that knew that, some, that, that Christ was getting ready to come the first time? What were these men called? Does the Bible say so? Where in the Bible does it say that? In Matthew. What chapter of the Bible? Chapter 2. What verse in the Bible? Look at Matthew 2. Let's look at it for a moment very quickly. Matthew 2. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 2 beginning in verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came, there came what, everybody? There came what? Wise men, Wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Why did they come? 
saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. Now, my brother and sister, I want to ask you a question. Look at this for a moment. Look at this for a moment. These wise men, at the first coming of Christ, these wise men at the first coming of Christ, not by simply going to the church, but they recognized by understanding world events that something was about to take place. Am I right or wrong? Now the Bible says that as it hath been, so shall it be. There is nothing new under the sun. In other words, history will be repeated. So if I want to know what's going to happen at the end of time, all I got to do is look at the beginning of time because history repeats itself. And so if I want to understand how events are going to be at the second advent, all I've got to do is look at what happened at the first advent and I will understand what's about to take place. Now at the first advent, were there men outside of the church that understood that the greatest event of the ages was about to take place? Yes or no? What were they called? Now, when you say wise, what are you telling me about a man who's wise? What type of man is a wise man? Talk to me, somebody. He is a what? He is a thinking man. Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. And so, my brothers and sisters, we should be able to look today, and if the second coming is about to take place and the world is about to end, the thinking men today should be doing what the wise men did back then, telling us that a crisis is right upon us. Are they doing that, yes or no? They're doing it right now. Now, my brothers and sisters, do we base our faith merely on what these wise men say? Now, do you remember at the first coming of Christ, even though those wise men did it, most of the church were ignorant that that Christ was about to take place. They were troubled when they heard that it was about to happen. And then so troubled that Herod said, you don't know nothing about this? What does your prophet say? It's amazing when the world has to ask us to read our prophets. Now, my brothers and sisters, all of a sudden the prophets were brought forth and they took out the written prophet. Look at what it says in verse 4. Matthew 2, verse 4. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, And when they gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, the religious leaders, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Let's read verse 5. Are you there? Amen. Verse 5, what does it say? And they said unto him, what? In Bethlehem of Judea. Why? For thus it is written by the wise men. Is that what they said? It says, for thus it is written how? Written how? Talk to me, somebody. By the what? By the prophets. It is written by the prophets. And that tells me, brothers and sisters, two things coincided at the first coming of Christ that gave evidence that the first coming was about to take place. It was the words of the wise man confirmed or being confirming what the words of the prophets had told us for many, many centuries. Am I right or wrong? So then at the second coming of Christ, what should we see if we're getting ready to reach the limit? We should see wise men again in every field of knowledge pointing to a global crisis of the world. And we should see the words of the prophets of the Bible agreeing with everything these wise men have said. And it confirms and gives evidence that it's about to take place. Are we together? And so what we have to do today, as we begin to go forth, we need to combine both of them. We need to see what, what are the wise men saying? And then we need to see what does the Bible say. And if the wise men say something that the Bible does not say, I say go with the Bible. What do you say? Amen. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And if the Bible says something but the wise men have not said it, it must mean that the time has not yet come. But if the wise men are saying what the Bible has already told us, and they're all pointing to the same time, I would say, wake up, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in 2024, the only thing we can say is wake up, because that's exactly what's happening right now. Now, as we look at what the wise men have said, we will find that you can go to every field of knowledge, and the wise men are telling us the time. What are the wise men saying today in every field of knowledge? When do they say we're going to see a great global crisis? What year do they say we should see a global crisis? What year? 20, 30. Well, you say, I don't have to worry about that. That's a long way away. 
That's just a few short years. Now, my brothers and sisters, but they told us, these same wise men, they said that that crisis would not wait to 2030. It says it would begin at a particular year. What time did they say it would all begin? In 2020. Now we, now we recognize something. That meant that the wise men, what they told us, is now somewhat part of history. Because 2020 is no longer future. 2020 is history. You and I are somewhere in the middle of that in 2024. In this, we're in the midst of this great crisis that these wise men have been talking about. We're in the middle of it right now. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. You remember when the pandemic hit Canada and America and the world in 2020? It grinded to halt every form of life. And the world looked and said, what does it mean? Do you know that God's people should have been able to look at the Bible and the prophets and tell us what it meant? Now, my brothers and sisters, that was not the end. That was what the Bible calls the beginning of the end. In Matthew 24... You remember the question was asked Jesus, what shall be the sign? Let's turn there, Matthew 24. Let's turn there quickly. In Matthew 24, the question was asked Jesus in verse 3. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? They asked about the end of the world, and then Jesus began to give them clear signs. They were asking him, when is the world going to come to the end? They asked him about the end of the world. Look at, ver look at Matthew 24, verse 3. Are you there, amen? Let's read verse 3. It says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives... The disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, the coming of Christ, and of the, what's the next word? End, not of a nation, but the end of the world. I'm talking about the global end. Now, my brother and sister, Jesus didn't say nobody can know, go home. Jesus gave the whole chapter to give the signs leading up to the end. He gave the whole chapter 25 to show the experience we needed with Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what he says in verse 6. You shall hear of what? Wars. What else? And rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is what? So he said, look, that's not the end. That's going to happen, yes, but that's not the end. He goes on to say in verse 7. For a nation shall rise against what? Now, I want you to notice what Jesus is doing. Jesus is telling us, if you want to understand the end, then you have to understand nations. You have to look at nation against nation. That's the relation between nations. Nations shall rise against nation. So you have to look at now, when I deal with nation against nation, what field of knowledge am I dealing with? We're looking at political knowledge. When we're looking at nation with... Uh, uh, we're looking at political knowledge. Nation against nation. Now, my brothers and sisters, and if that political knowledge, nation against nation, happened a long time ago, then we're looking at a political knowledge that we can find in what field of knowledge? Something called what? Talk to me. History. Now, Jesus is saying we can look at political knowledge and begin to know where we are in this world's history. We're going to keep going. Hold on for a moment. Next verse. And continue on. It says in verse 7, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be what? Now, what is a famine? What is a famine? Now, do you know that a famine includes more than hunger? Do you remember, you remember in the book of Amos, the Bible says that in the last days we're going to hear that there's going to be a famine in the land, but not a famine of bread and water. You know, when there's a lack of water, that's still called a famine. A lack of food, that's called a famine. My brother and sister, a famine is really talking about a famine is a lack of resources. The resources that sustain life. Jesus is saying we can look at the famine. We can look at a lack of resources on the earth and know if the world is going to come to an end. Jesus is saying we have to study these fields of knowledge. We've got to study political knowledge. We must study resource knowledge. What do we call the study of resources? We call that geology. We call that ecology. These are studies that Jesus is saying if we studied them, we could understand where we are in this world's history. Then he said... And pestilences. What is pestilences? Talk to me, somebody. That is what? Disease. Of worldwide portion. What do we call worldwide diseases? We don't call them epidemics. What do we call worldwide diseases? Pandemics. We should look at pandemics and understand where we are. And then the Bible says, in Matthew 24, it goes on to say, and earthquakes, that earthquake, if you go to the original language, that word earthquake means storms and tempests. That's what the word means, a storm and a tempest. In other words, environmental devastation. And so my brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying, we should be able to look at the climate. 
We should be able to look at the climate that creates hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes, and we should be able to look at that and see where we are in the history of the world. And then Jesus said, when you see all these on world proportion, verse 8, all these are not the end, they are the Now remember, what's he talking about though? He's talking about the signs of his coming and the So then this signs are not the end, they are the beginning of the end. And all of these things we saw begin to pick up in 2020. Now, my brothers and sisters, the thinking men are telling us this. You remember we saw this popular science magazine talking about the very thing we're talking about in science. And they said that the 1972 report found that if civilization continued on its path toward increasing consumption, the global economy would collapse by what year? By what year? 2030. You remember they said when it was going to start. The second paragraph said, is, in fact, it says, as reported by the Australian broadcaster, the model's calculation took into account trends in what? Pollution levels? First paragraph. What else? Population growth? What else? The amount of what? Now, you remember, that's the very thing Jesus told us to look at. The very thing Jesus told us to look at, they put this in the calculation, and guess when they said it was going to start? It wasn't going to wait until 2030. Second paragraph says, in fact, 2020 is the first milestone. Next paragraph, at around 2020, the condition of the planet becomes highly critical. We looked at these wise men telling us this, but now we turn to a different field of knowledge. Here's history now. The historian says, while the fall of the American empire will come by what? 2030. Look at the name of the article, Big Think. These are the thinking men telling us this. Now, my brothers and sisters, but when do the historians tell us that the crisis is going to start? They don't say it's going to wait until 2030. Now, look, the historians, they're not just looking at now resources and climate. They're looking at the political conditions that exist among the nations. In fact, he said, living in such tense and mercurial times, it is easy to see that most Americans do not have strong confidence in their country's what? Future. This is according to the poll data from Real Clear Politics. They're looking at the political condition. Now, look at what he says, the historian, looking at this political condition. Let's read that together. First paragraph. It says, the historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by what year? 2020, and will reach a critical mass no later than what? Now, I want you to understand what's happening. The man that was talking the first time, those group of men were scientists looking at the condition and resources of the world. This man is not looking at that field. He's looking at another field of knowledge. He's looking at history and politics, but he's coming to the same conclusion. You understand what I'm telling you? Now, in the beginning of end, there's a difference between the time and the end of the beginning. One person said to me well, in another place, they said, well, I, I thought the time of the end was 1798, uh, beginning of the end of 1798. The 1798 is the time of the end. 2020 is not the time of the end. 2020 is the beginning of the end. Now, look what this says. In the U.S. Sustainable Goals, United Nations report says nature, nature's dangerous decline is unwhat? Presidented. Species extinction, extinction rates accelerating. Now, I want to ask you, does anybody know what extinction means? What is the word extinction? What does that mean? The word extinction. What does that mean? That means when living organisms exit the world through death, they die. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that the thinking men today that really look at the science are telling us that right now, extinction has already started on this planet? This is not a question. This is something that almost every scientist understands. Nature declining at an unprecedented rate with grave impacts on people now likely reports fine. The scale of decline, eroding the foundations of economies, livelihoods, food security. This is 2019. Now, guess what today? Do you know that today, every day that passes, do you know that over 200 plants and animals become extinct every day? You understand what that means? I mean, to sit back and understand that, we have to understand Do you understand that 200 species of plants and animals are dying every day. Killing the biosphere to fast track what? What's that, what's that first word say? Have fast track what? Not just plant, but what? Human extinction. Some say, I never thought there could be human extinction. You better watch out, brothers and sisters. We're going to show you something from the Bible. Now, human extinction. I want to ask you a question. What would it take for humans to become extinct? Now, there was a man 
Now, now let me read that first before I say that. Several years ago in Cameroon, a country in West Africa, a Western black rhinoceros was killed. It was the last of its kind where on earth. Now can you imagine that uh, the, the earth is not infinite, that you can come to a last type of tree and you can, you can see a type of tree, let's say a maple tree. You know that you can kill all maple trees and eventually you come to the last maple tree. And then what symbol would Canada have? You can come to the last rhinoceros, the last elephant, the last this, the last day, and every day 200 things are coming to the last. And this means something to us. Scientists agree the world faces what? Mass extinction. Here we go again, Earth's major what? Mass extinction. Most scientists agree this is not even something that's debatable. Scientists are not even questioning this. They know that we're in the midst of an extinction right now because so many things are dying in every field of, this, in, of living organisms. Now, most scientists, though, that are, are afraid to actually tell the truth of what they say. Because if they did so, you know that the average public, the, the, the mainstream scientist, is being paid to make sure that nobody gets scared. You remember years ago, you ever heard about the, remember the ozone layer? Remember that? That there was holes in ozone layer? And they're talking about how big it was? You know, the day you don't, most don't hear about ozone layers today. But you know, it didn't get no better. But today, if man understood how terrible it was, he would be afraid to walk outside. And so the media is almost controlled by how much information they can put out. And many scientists are afraid because if they speak what they know, they would lose their jobs, lose their sustenance, and so they don't talk so much. But there is one scientist, and there are a few, but one of the scientists who said, I, I cannot be a scientist and not tell the world what's happening. And this scientist, he was a, 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 a man by the name of Guy McPherson. Now, my brothers and sisters, he taught at several universities in America. And what he did, he was a, he was a, 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 a scientist who dealt with biology. He was not even dealing with human beings. He was dealing with plants and animals, and he was looking at his specialty was on extinction of plants and animals. But as he started studying it, he began to start noticing that when something becomes extinct, there are two main reasons why something becomes extinct. Does anybody know? Two main reasons why something becomes extinct. What's the first main reason? Uh, pollution? The first main reason is actually population loss. Population loss. In other words, that as, the, as the certain things begin to start dying off and it loses population, they cannot now pro, uh, procreate and it cannot now multiply. And so it begins to reduce its lifespan until it actually becomes extinct. So the first main reason why something is lost is population loss. The second main reason why something becomes extinct, does anybody know what the second main reason is? That's is right, my brother. It's the loss of habitat. What does habitat mean? Habitation, living. Now, my brothers and sisters, remember, there's a bound to our habitation. The Bible says in Acts 17. And so loss of habitat is the second main reason. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Is the world getting, getting ready to become extinct because of a population loss? We have over 8 billion people in this world today. That's not, the, the, that's not, not going to lead to an extinction. So that leaves one major opportunity for there to be an extinction on human, uh, in humanity. And that extinction is based on what? Habit, loss of what? Habitat. Now, in order for there to be a loss of habitat, something would have to happen to the, ec the, the ecological system that we're living in right now. And my question is, do we see the climate change destroying our habitat? Yes or no? Now, look what this man said. And clearly time is running out. Now, you would think they were preaching a Bible study. They're talking about science. You are, if you're gull 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 gullible enough to believe the elite-sponsored delusion that promotes inaction, that maximizes corporate profits in the meantime, because we're supposed to have until the end of the century, far from it, however, and some courageous what? Scientists invariably denied access to mainstream news outlets explain it and something called near-term human extinction is now the most likely outcome. Now, one of those men, one of the scientists is Professor Guy McPherson. I would say, look that man up, but that man, he's an atheist. He doesn't understand the Bible point, but he knows what's happening in the world. He sees what's going on. Now, my brother and sister, it says, who offers compelling, not ideas, but compelling what? Evidence. He looks at article after article, not just article from CNN and, 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 and all these news outlets, but he's looking at peer-reviewed journals. Anybody know science? You know the peer-reviewed journals are the main source of any intellectual study. And he says he's looking at them one after another. It says, compelling evidence that human beings will be extinct. Now look what the man says. By what? By what? By 2030. He says, 
For a summary of the evidence of this, which emphasizes the usually neglected synergy impacts of many of these de uh, de destructive trends. Last paragraph, why 2030? Is he saying 2030, any, many, mighty, mo 2030, here we go? We just, that's not what he's doing. He's looking at data. He's looking at information. He's looking at research. He's looking at all of the systems of this world. It says, because according to McPherson, the perfect storm of environmental assaults that we are now inflicting on the earth, including the 28 self-reinforcing climate feedback loops. In other words, when you, know, it, when you do something, in, it, for example, in 2020, do you know that people thought that I was going to make the, 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 the environment better? Because when you grounded so many planes, it was not so much pollution put, being put in the air. That was the least planes ever flew in the history of this world. But you know, at the same time, when they stopped flying, the, 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 the environment and, and the climate still got worse because without them putting out what they put in the air, it stopped the greenhouse gases uh, from having that cloud that, that, that was buffering it, and it actually made it, the heat increase more and more. So no matter which way you turn, it's a loop, a cycle. In other words, there's no way out of the crisis we're in right now. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, so far, it is beyond the Earth's capacity to absorb that there will be an ongoing succession of terminal breakdowns of the key e ecological system and processes that is what? Habitat loss over the next decade that will precipitate the demise of homo sapiens, talking about human beings. Now, my brothers and sisters, this scientist, they're looking at 2030 as that year that could bring extinction. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you think that such a possibility could ever take place? Someone says no. It would be amazing. You know what we need to do? We see what the wise men say, the science. You know what we need to go? We need to go to the Word of God and see what it says. You will be amazed to see that God actually says that if he did not cut the limits short, the human beings would become extinct. And we're going to see, brothers and sisters, Again, that this wise man is right on target based on the word of God. Do we need to get ready, yes or no? Yes. One of the greatest things we need to do right now is start praying like never before. I want to stop and I want to pray and say, dear God, as we get ready to go deeper into our study, we need Jesus like never before. What do you say? How much time are we going to spend in prayer? How much time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Is that a long time? But when you don't know, when you don't know somebody, two minutes is a what? long time. But do you know that day by day, as we get to know Jesus, two minutes is going to seem like nothing. We're going to know him and so, so close that we're going to get to Christ that eternity will seem like the drop of a bucket. I want to get to know Jesus. What do you say? And so we're going to kneel right now and we're going to take two minutes and talk to Jesus. And after two minutes of prayer, silent prayer, we'll go deeper into our subject, the great clock of time, part two. Would you please forget everybody in this congregation and talk to Jesus? Ask him to give you an experience with him so that we can be ready to meet him. Oh, Father in heaven, it's amazing how two minutes can seem long when we don't know someone. But the more we get to know you, Lord, we will see that time will give way to eternity. And right now, Lord, we're at the edge of eternity. Soon, Lord, you will come from the clouds in the sky and your second advent will be here and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up. 
And Lord, our greatest need to be caught up with Jesus is a relationship where we know you as a close, intimate, and personal friend. Father, I beg of you today that you will remove every distraction. I pray that you will close talking mouths. I pray that you will gather in distracted and diverted minds so that we're focused on one thing, and that thing, let it be the focus of Jesus Christ. Help us to see, Lord, that if ever there was a time to study our Bibles, it's now. And if ever there was a time for a radical change, it's now. And the only one that can help us is you. And so, Father, we're here tonight. And we're asking that you will make plain to our weak minds. Give us understanding that we can see clearly from the Scriptures that the end of all things is at hand. And that it's not accidental that we're here tonight that you're trying to save us. I pray, Lord, that you will be with the, every person in this room, that you will send angels to each pew, to the young mind and to the old mind, that you would minister to our hearts and bring a conviction that will not allow us to be comfortable and complacent, but that will make us see our need of running to Jesus without delay. And so, Father, as we get into the study tonight, I need you to speak to us. I'm weak, I'm feeble, I'm frail. But Lord, I ask that you would take possession of this earthen vessel and that you will speak to me and through me to us so that we will know that we have been in your presence. Abide with us now, we pray. Remove every distraction, for we ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel chapter 12. We're going to the book of Daniel chapter 12, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. What book did I say? We're going to Daniel, the 12th chapter. In Daniel chapter 12, I want us to notice what the Bible says in Daniel, the 12th chapter. Now, please, brothers and sisters, I want you to listen to me very carefully tonight. I want to make it as clear as I can tonight. You and I tonight are not living in the ordinary times. We're living in the most solemn and the most significant time of all the ages. We're living tonight in the last days of this world's history. And never before in the history of this world has there been a generation that had to face issues as serious as we are facing right now tonight. Never has there been a generation that faced a crisis of such magnitude, of such importance, of such dire, dire consequences. Our eternal destiny is at stake and this is why we must run to Jesus without delay and Satan does not want us to understand what's taking place about us and the sad reality is not only the world but we're told the majority of the church has no idea what's about to take place. As an overwhelming surprise it's going to come upon us and break upon us and God intended that you and I should be the light in the midst of this moral darkness but we're just as much in darkness as the rest of the world. And God is telling us, please come back to the scriptures so that we can see it as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Something is about to take place in this earth. And the Bible says it's going to be more serious and severe than anything that we've ever witnessed. In fact, the Bible says it's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. Look what the Bible says in Daniel. What book did I say? Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. Daniel 12, beginning in verse 1. Are you there? Amen. Let's read that together. It says, and at that time, what's going to happen? Shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And the Bible says, and there shall be a time of trouble such as, what's the text say? Such as what? Now look at the Bible. Look what it says. It says, there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this for a moment. All of us have seen trouble. Am I right or wrong? We talk about family trouble. We talk about car trouble. We talk about financial trouble and health troubles. All of us have seen trouble. But the Bible says that what's coming upon us is a time of trouble such as never was. Now, we've seen the trouble even as an, on a national level or a worldwide, global level. I mean, look at the human atrocities that we have seen. Look at World War I, the thousands of lives that were lost in World War I. Look at World War II. Look at the, the bomb, the atomic bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima. Look at the millions of mangled bodies that died throughout the years. Look at the tragedies and tragic events. Look at the genocides and the murders and the killings, the brutal killings. Look at the genocide that took place in the Holocaust. Over six million Jews lost their lives. Look at the genocide that happened in Cambodia. Two-thirds of the population wiped out today. Look at the genocide in Rwanda, thousands upon thousands, nothing but skulls left in this place and that place. 
Look at the, 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 the black holocaust that happened under the institution of slavery, over 60 million slaves under the most brutal institution. Think about the dark ages. 50 to 100 million Christians burnt at the stake, killed and tortured and maligned, and the Bible says this was terrible, but all of this is going to pale into insignificance in comparison to what's about to take place in this world. The Bible says it's going to be a time of trouble such as never was, which means we're going to need an experience with Jesus such as never was. No generation has been called to have such a closeness with God, such an intimate experience and personal relationship with God as you and I must have in this last hour. In fact, Daniel 12 says, in verse 1, it says it's going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, it says, thy people shall be what? What does the Bible say? Shall be delivered. Is God going to have somebody ready? Yes or no? Yes, he is. But what would happen if God were to allow the time of trouble and the end of the world to play itself out? Go to the book of Matthew. What book did I say? We're going to Matthew chapter 24. The Bible tells us that this time of trouble and tribulation is going to be so great. Now, you have your Bible, too. I want you to look at this with me in Matthew 24. Let's look at it together. Matthew 24. I want us all to see this. In Matthew 24, over and over again, we want to look at the text, making sure everything is coming from the Word of God. In Matthew 24, beginning in verse 21, notice what the Bible says, how bad the tribulation will be. In verse 21, let's read that together. It says, for then shall be what? Great tribulation. How great, Jesus? Jesus says, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever what shall be. Now look at verse 22. Then the Bible says, except those days should be shortened. What does it say? There should be what? Now when he says no flesh, what does that mean? No flesh. What does no flesh mean? That's human beings. So God is saying, if he did not shorten the time of trouble, what would happen to human beings? Human beings would become what? Extinct. So that tells us as we see that a time is coming to human extinction, God has to come before that takes place. He's going to cut it short. So now, brothers and sisters, the Bible is telling us human extinction would naturally take place if it were not for the mercy of God and cutting short the history of this world. And so, my brothers and sisters, that tells me today what is going on today shows me that we need an experience with Jesus such as never was. This is why every night you come, I cannot play with you. I want you to see for yourself what I'm saying is not I'm making it up. What does the Bible say? We must see this for ourselves. I told us every night, bring our Bibles. Did I not? Yes or no? I told us every night, study. This is why I tell children to listen and why we must not be walking about and careless all over the place because this experience is going to come in our generation. We're going to need such an experience with God that we can go through this crisis that is just ahead of us and that will never happen unless we know God. And my brothers and sisters, you know we're told that not one of us is ready for what's about to take place. Not one of us. In fact, inspiration says, speaking of this very time, inspiration says, we are not ready. Look what the prophet says in early writings, page 119. It says, I saw that not just the world, but that the what? Talk to me, somebody. What does it say? That the remnant were not prepared for what is coming upon the earth something is coming it says stupidity like lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of most of those who profess to believe that we were having the last message then the prophet said my accompanying angel cried out with awful solemnity one phrase three times get ready get ready get ready for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to be poured out without mixture. Look what it says. His wrath will be poured out without, uh, without, without mercy and you are not ready. Rend the heart and not the garment. A great work must be done, not for the world, but a great work must first be done for who? For the remnant. This is why the meetings are taking place in this church today. This is why God is trying to reach us. Before we can reach the world and other churches, God is trying to reach seven-day Adventists because, brothers and sisters, we are sleeping right now. God is saying, please wake up. Time is running out. And the moment we understand the plan of redemption, the moment we understand the love of God, the truth of God, the beauty of Christ, there is born in our soul the spirit of urgency and the same spirit of urgency that was in the life and ministry of Jesus must be in us. In fact, John chapter 9, what book did I say? We're going to the gospel of John chapter 9 and notice what the Bible says in John the ninth chapter. And John 9, you remember last night, we talked about something. I want to give a quick review as we go deeper tonight. But we noticed that something last night, we saw that Jesus was urgent. Was Jesus urgent, yes or no? Of all the Bible, when you study it, 
from Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end, no one was more urgent than Jesus because no one understood the plan of redemption better than Jesus. And my brothers and sisters, when you become urgent, all we're doing is following in the footsteps of Christ. Jesus wants us to become just like himself. And just as Jesus was urgent, we must become urgent. In John chapter 9, beginning in verse 4, notice what Jesus said. Let's read that together. You know the text. Verse 4, it says, I not might work, I what? Must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why? The night cometh when what? No man can work. There's going to come a time when even Jesus himself, I say it respectfully, will not be able to work to save you or me. At that moment, probation closes. And God is saying, please, while I have opportunity to work to save the sinner, come to me. And someone says, but look at my sins. Do you know that God is such a great Savior? It doesn't matter how many mistakes we've made. If we come to Jesus now, there's enough blood to cleanse us from all sin. Every problem, every situation that's gone wrong in the individual, in the family, there's a plan, a redemption that can save marriages, that can save houses, that can save children, that can save youth and adults. But we've got to come to Jesus. And now, my brothers and sisters... Jesus had this urgency. Now, we know that Jesus was urgent. But my question last night was, was he urgent? We know that. My question was, why was Jesus so urgent? Are you going to answer, answer this question? Why was Jesus so urgent? And we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that now. Let's go here. Why was Jesus so urgent? Let's ask that. Why was Jesus so urgent? He, time was running out. Yes, but, 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 but in order for time to run out, he had to know something else. Very important. He had to know that there was a, a limit. Jesus knew that there was a limit. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's what it means when he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, because the night or the limit comes when no man can work. Now, my brothers and sisters, my question tonight is, how did Jesus know that he had a limit? Was it because he was God on earth? He was infinite in knowledge? Yes or no? Now, he was God, but in his humanity, he learned the way you and I can learn. He learned the way you and I must learn. How did Jesus know? Talk to me, somebody. He knew because he understood the great clock of time. We studied it last night. Well, how did he understand the great clock of time? He had the word of God. Everything he found, he found the great clock of time was in the Bible. And all he had was Genesis to Malachi. Now, my brothers and sisters, when he studied the Bible, inside of the Bible, something was there that made him understand the great clock of time. What was in the Bible that made him understand the great clock of time? Talk to me, somebody. The plan of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, in that plan of redemption, where did he find an understanding of the plan of redemption that showed him the great clock of time? Where did he find that? In the sanctuary. And the Bible says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Psalm 77, 13. Now, Jesus started his public ministry. It's right there on the screen. I'm testing you, but it's an open book test. What year did Jesus start his public ministry? What year? 27 AD. Very good. Next question. How long did that year last? How how long did his ministry, how long was his ministry to last for the entire Jewish nation? How long was it to last? Talk to me. When was it ending? When did it end? What year did it end? 34 AD. That's when Stephen was stoned and the gospel went from the Jews to the Gentiles according to Acts. So now my brothers and sisters, seven years Jesus is working. And 27 and 34 is how many years? How many years? Is that important? In the Bible, seven is no ordinary number. Seven is the number that God works on. Remember we said that a computer has something called a what? Binary code. What is the binary code that all the computer works off of? Zero and one. But we said that God has a unicode. Uni means what? One. And what number does the Bible and the plan of redemption and the sanctuary and all of heaven and the universe work off of? What number? Seven. Now, my brothers and sisters, the entire Bible built on that. The plan of redemption built on that. The book of Revelation built on that. And Jesus' ministry built on that. Seven years. Now, Jesus would not be able to work the whole seven and a half years on earth The first part of his ministry, he did himself. The last part, he did through his disciples. What year did Jesus die on the cross that cut short the ministry of the entire seven years that he had to work through his disciples? What year did Jesus die on the cross? 31 AD. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did Jesus know that he had until 34 AD? Did Jesus know that he was going to die on the cross? Did Jesus know that he was going to die on the cross in the year 31 AD? Did he know that he was going to die on the cross in the month that he died? Yes. Did he know the day he was going to die? Yes. 
Did he know the hour he was going to die? Now, my brothers and sisters, how did Jesus know the day, the month, and the hour? How did he know? Because of that great clock of time found in the plan of redemption as he studied the sanctuary. Now, what was he studying inside the sanctuary? What was he studying inside the sanctuary that let him know the day, the month, the hour that he was going to die? Talk to me, somebody. What was he studying inside the sanctuary? He was something inside the sanctuary, but particularly the sanctuary, something that was there. He was studying something that I gave you in your homework. He was studying the seven feasts of the sanctuary service. That that sanctuary was operating on services inside the sanctuary, and there were how many of them? How many of them? Seven. Where can we find those seven feasts of the sanctuary? Where can we find them? In Leviticus chapter 23. Now, homework, I gave you seven feasts. You should be able to tell me by name what those seven feasts are, and I pray that you even begin to know the dates of those seven feasts. What was the first feast? Passover. Let me correct. I said the Passover already came, but it didn't come this year yet. The Jews have been coming together, getting ready for this big event, but it's going to take place, I believe, on the 22nd of April is when the Jew, uh, they're going to celebrate Passover this year. They're getting ready for it right now. But Passover, what day is Passover in the biblical time? What day is Passover? 14th day of the first month, Abib. That's when it starts. What is the second feast? What's the second feast? No, the second feast, no, 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 not, not first fruit. Second feast, second feast. Unleavened bread. Now, I'm going to have to say, did you do your homework? I need a, we might have to take our belt off now. I don't think they did their homework, my sister. <laughs> Leviticus 23 tells now the second feast is unleavened bread. What date? 15th day of the first month. What was the third feast? What was the third feast? First fruits. What was the day of the first fruits? What day was that? What was the date? 16th day of the first month. What was the fourth feast? Pentecost. This happened 50 days after the, after the first fruits. What was the fifth feast? Feast of trumpets. What was the month? What was the date of this feast? What was the date? The first day of the seventh month. Now you begin to interest and you'll notice that there's a big time break from that time. In the seventh month, because remember, God finishes everything in what? Sevens. And so these feasts ended on the seventh month because that's the number that heaven operates on. And so my brothers and sisters, the seventh month, first day, was the Feast of Trumpets. What was the sixth feast? The Day of Atonement. The day of atonement. That was the most sacred time in all of the Jewish year, the Day of Atonement. And that was the cleansing of the sanctuary. What was the seventh feast, the final feast? What was it called? Now, we're not talking tonight. I'm, I'm going to make sure that we're not talking. I don't want to have to embarrass anybody, but please, we want to make sure that everything we're looking at is in the Word of God. This is too serious. We've got to see what the Word of God says. What is the final feast in that sanctuary service? What is the final feast? Talk to me, somebody. The feast of tabernacles. Now, my brothers and sisters, that happened beginning on the 15th day of the seventh month. These feasts were very important, and you remember that these feasts happened in two ways. They were fulfilled. Look what it says. It says, this, it says arguments drawn from Old Testament types pointed to the autumn at the time when the event represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary must take place. This was made very clear as attention was given to the manner in which the types relating to the what, everybody? The what? First advent of Christ had been what? Fulfilled. So as they look at the first heaven of Christ, they notice something. The slaying of the Passover lamb was a shadow. It tells us these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the time. So we saw that all of these types or shadows or events in the sanctuary, these types, another name was, we saw yesterday, another name was what? Talk to me. Shadows. Another name was what? examples, patterns, all of this. We saw they were fulfilled in two ways. They were fulfilled as to the event, and they were also fulfilled as to the time. So when you study these feasts in the sanctuary, you have to look at it in two ways. You've got to look at the events that were to take place, and then we must also understand the timing of those events because they have an antitype. Now remember, understanding this would give us an understanding of the time. Now, someone says, how could understanding feasts give us an understanding of the time? Now, I want to make it very simple. These feasts were like holidays. 
They were God's holy days, and as the world calls them, holidays. Now, if you had holidays and you understood them, we could know where we were in time based on that. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we continue to study that every talking mouth will be closed. This is too important. I pray, Lord, that angels from the world of light would touch our hearts to see that if ever there was a time to close mouths so that we can hear Jesus talk to us, it's now. Please, dear God, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. The coming of the Lord is about to take place. Do you know that, that, that if, if man sees and is unprepared for the coming of the Lord, when Jesus comes back, many at that time will wish that they knew Christ for themselves. They will wish that they could look at this time and instead of being careless and playing, they would have said, Lord, I wish that I use all of that time to get to know you. And this is why it's so important tonight that we take advantage of all the time that we have left. You see, time is running out in this generation. Now, you could look at holy days or holidays and know where we were in the calendar. For example, do we have holidays that we celebrate in this world? Give me some holidays that are celebrated in this world. Give me a holiday. Christmas. Christmas. Give me another one. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Another one. Easter. Now, now, can you look at those holidays and see where you are at the beginning of the year or the end of the year? Can you do that? Now, let me test you. I'm going to test you because what we can do is look at those holidays and see if we're at the beginning or the end. If I said that we're at New Year's Eve, beginning or end? We're at the beginning. What if I said Valentine's Day has passed by? Where am I, beginning or end? Beginning. beginning. What if I said that, that, that uh, 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 Canada's Thanksgiving has taken place? Am I still at the beginning or am I moving on? Am I moving on? I'm moving further. What if I said Thanksgiving? What if I said Christmas? Beginning of the year or end of the year? So I could look at the holiday and in the calendar know if I'm at the beginning of that year or the end of that year. God has given these seven feasts like holidays or holy days so that if we understand them and study them, we will know if we're at the beginning of time or if we're at, that, or if we're at the end of time. And so what we have to do is look at these feasts. It says, in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled when? At the time pointed out where? In the symbolic service. Question, was Jesus born on time? Did he resurrect on time? Did he go into the holy place on time? Did he move in October 22nd, 1844 into the most holy place on time? Then Jesus is going to come back when? On time. These types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. So what we're doing is looking at the shadows. Now, I want you to look at the shadow for a moment. Now, can I look at a shadow and know what the real thing is doing? What if I still couldn't see the real thing? If a man could not see my hand, but all he could see was the shadow on the board, you could know if my hand was moving just by looking at the what? Shadow. Now, does the shadow show everything? But it shows the basic outline of what's taking place. You don't see the person's color of skin. You don't know what color that man's skin is when you look at a shadow. You don't see every detail of the hair and the lines, but you see the basic outline so that we get a basic understanding when you look at the shadow or the example. Does that make sense? So I want you to look at this shadow, and I want you to tell me when I get to the final generation. The first generation is here. The final generation is at the other end. Now I want you to look at the shadow, and I want you to tell me, can you tell if we're at the final generation just by following the shadow without guessing? Are you looking at the shadow? All right. Look at number one. Are we at the final generation? Yes or no? No. Now, the shadow has moved a little bit closer, but are we at the final generation? Yes or no? No. Is the shadow moving? Yes or no? But are we at the final generation yet? Yes or no? When you look at the shadow, you can see its movement, but you don't have to guess. Are we at the final generation? Are we at the final generation now? Are we getting closer? Now, are you guessing that we're getting closer? You are what? You're not guessing. You're watching the what? Movement of the shadow, and you can know from the shadow what the real thing is doing. Then when you look now, question, are we at the final generation now? You don't see it yet. What about now? Yes. That's the final generation. Now, I want to give you a secret. The sixth feast takes us to the final generation. The sixth feast takes us to the final generation. And the seventh feast takes us past the final generation and takes us from earth. Guess where the, 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 the seventh feast takes us? It takes us where? To heaven. 
Remember the expression, the phrase that we learned yesterday? All sevens take us to heaven. All sevens take us where? To heaven. So when we get to the seventh feast, we're going to end and celebrate that final feast in heaven. Now tonight, I want us to be able to look at this because remember, in a puzzle, when you put together a jigsaw puzzle, you first put together the what? The first thing that we do when you have a puzzle, the first thing we do is that we put together the what? We put together the border, the limits. And once we put together the border, then we can, and then, then, then we can begin to start putting together inside once we see the picture. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to look tonight and actually see what that is. We're going to see that 6,000 years will be on earth, 1,000 years will be in heaven, and we're going to see it's going to take place as we study the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, my brothers and sisters, did you do your homework? I see some smiles. You did your homework, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to have faith. I believe that in Barry, you did your homework. Now, in Leviticus chapter 23, let's turn there quickly, because in Leviticus 23, we see the shadow. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the shadow. Now, what number is the Feast of Tabernacles? We're unlocking the Feast of Tabernacles from the Bible. What number is the Feast of Tabernacles? What number of the feasts? One, two, three, or seven? It's the seven feasts. Good. Now, what we want to do right now is look at two things. These shadows or types or feasts must be fulfilled as to the event and as to the time. Just as Jesus in Passover, not only did the event take place of him dying on the cross, that was the event of the Passover, but Jesus' death happened on time. Jesus died in 31 AD on the 14th day of the first month AB at the very time for 1,500 years that the lamb was killed. He died on time. So all of these feasts have to happen not only as to the event, but also as to the time. So first, we want to look at the event of the Feast of Tabernacles. What is the Feast of Tabernacles foreshadowing? Go to Leviticus chapter 23. In Leviticus chapter 23, we find the Feast of Tabernacles in verse 39. What verse did I say? Now, let's look at that together. Leviticus 23 and verse 39. Let's read that together. Leviticus 23 and verse 39. Let's read that together. The Bible says, also in the 15th day of what month? Remember, God finishes everything on sevens. In the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast where? Unto the Lord seven days. And on the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. We see here this Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the first thing that I want us to see of the event so we can understand what the Feast of Tabernacles is about is the very first thing I want you to see right here. The very first thing of the Feast of Tabernacle is that it must be celebrated when? Celebrated when? Look on the screen. What's the first thing? Open book test. On the screen, number one, it must be celebrated when? After the harvest. Does the Bible say so, yes or no? The first thing that we see about the Feast of Tabernacles is that it must be celebrated after the harvest. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 16. And I want us to see that from the Bible. We'll come back. We'll come back to Leviticus 23. Hold your thumb there. But go to, Le- go to Deuteronomy 16. And I want us to see in Deuteronomy 16 that the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated after the harvest. Please write this down. Take notes. Make sure you see this because if we understand this, we'll understand where we are in this earth's history. This is very important. Look at what the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 16. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We're studying the Bible, text upon text. It's a wonderful thing when you don't have to make up one thing. Everything we believe is in the Word of God. Look what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 16. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Let's read verse 13 together. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 13. All together. What does verse 13 say? Thou shalt observe the what? Feast of tabernacles seven days. When? When? After thou hast gathered or harvested in thy corn and thy wine. So the Bible says that the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated when? When? After the harvest. Not before the harvest, but what? After the harvest. Was it a day of sadness or was it a day of rejoicing? You look at the next verse. It says, and thou shalt rejoice where? In thy feast. Let's go back to Leviticus 23. So the first thing we see in the shadow is that the Feast of Tabernacles, that the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated when? After the harvest. 
It was a day of rejoicing celebrated after the harvest. What's the second thing that we find out about this feast? The second thing we find out is that the feast was not only celebrated after the harvest, but the feast was celebrated by waving something. Look at what the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 20 uh, and Leviticus chapter 23. We're going back to Leviticus 23. And notice what the Bible says in Leviticus 23, beginning now in Leviticus 23 in verse 40. Are you there? Amen. Look at verse 40. Let's read verse 40 together. Verse 40 says, And ye shall take of you on the first day the bows of goodly trees. What's the next word? Now, I want you to circle that in your Bible. Please, this is very important. Circle in your Bible branches. This is the event. This is the event. Circle in your Bible branches. Underline it. Put a star beside it. Very significant. Not just any branch, but notice what it says. And verse 40, it says... You shall, it says, take branches of what? Talk to me, somebody. Branches of what? I can't. Now, I want everybody to say this. We want to stop right here. I want everybody to say this. Branches of what? Palm trees. Now, I want to make sure you say on this side. Now, on this side, I want to hear you say it. Branches of palm trees. Branches of what? Palm trees. Now, you sounded good. You had a few people that you sounded good. Right here. What type of branches? Branches of what? Palm trees. Now, you sound even stronger. Praise the Lord. What are over here? Branches of what? And you, you sounded very good, very, very nice. And over here, branches of what? Palm trees. Branches of palm trees, praise God. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's going to come back to us. Very important because remember, not only in an in in event, not only by time, but the event has to be fulfilled. It has to happen like the shadow. So now my brothers and sisters, it says that they celebrate the Feast of palm, uh, uh, Tabernacles with branches of palm trees and the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. How long? Seven days. So we see they celebrated with palm trees, uh, excuse me, palm branches, and it was a day of, not sadness, but a day of what? Rejoicing. They were happy about something. The day of atonement had just passed. Now they were rejoicing in salvation. Now my brothers and sisters, what was the third thing? The third thing was that they were to dwell in what? Booze. The Bible says that not only were they to celebrate with palm, uh, palm branches, but they were to, uh, uh, to, to dwell in booze. Look at verse 42. Verse 42. It says, Ye shall dwell in booze seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in what? Booze. Now, a booze is a temporary dwelling place. In other words, when they were going through the, the, through, the, uh, th- uh, through the wilderness journey from Egypt to Canaan land, did they stay in big palaces, permanent houses, or did they stay in tents? They stayed in tents. Those were these, the, 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 these temporary dwellings because they were pilgrims. They didn't have permanent homes. They were pilgrims traveling through. And so when they got into the promised land, after the harvest, they were to take these palm branches and they were to make themselves little simple booze that they were to dwell in that were temporary dwellings to be commemorative of when they were journeying from Egypt to Canaan to remind them of their temporary journey, a sojourn from Egypt to Canaan. It was to remind them of that. In fact, it was commemorative. Look what the Bible says in verse 43. Verse 43 says that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in what? Booze. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. So number four, it was a memorial of their wilderness journey. In other words, they couldn't celebrate it in the wilderness. They had to celebrate it after they got out of the wilderness to remind them that they were once in temporary dwellings, that now that they're in the promised land. Are we together? It was a memorial of wilderness journey they celebrated after they got into the Canaan land. And then number five, finally, it was a feast or a great supper. They feasted on this day. So five things, events in the time. What was the first? It was celebrating when? What was the first? Celebrating when? After the harvest. Two, it was a celebrate with what? With what? Palm branches. And it was not a day of sadness, but a day of what? Rejoicing. Number three. They dwelt in booze, which was a temporary dwelling. Number four, it was a memorial of their journey from Egypt to Canaan after they got into the promised land. And number five, it was a great feast, a great supper. Now, my brothers and sisters, I wonder when this event will be fulfilled, not in type, but in the antitype. When will it be filled? Let's see what it says. Go in your Bible, Revelation. What book did I say? 
Go to Revelation chapter 7. We're going to let the Bible explain itself. Go to Revelation chapter 7. And you're going to see something by God's grace that you've never seen before. That's going to open up like a picture. You'll see the puzzle coming together. Now look what the prophet says. You go to Revelation 7. Hold your thumb there. We'll come to it in just a moment. And Patriarchs and Prophets 541. Notice the event that fulfills the tabernacles. Let's read it together. All of us that can read this, let's read it together. What does it say? It says the Feast of Tabernacle was not only what? Commemorative but typical. It not only pointed back to their wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of the fruits of the earth and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering, when the Lord of the harvest shall send forth his reapers to gather the tares together and bundles for the fire and to gather the wheat into his what? Garner. The people of Israel, as they call to mind his mercy and their deliverance from the bondage of Egypt and his tender care for them during their pilgrim life in the wilderness, it says they rejoice. Why? It was a day of what? Rejoicing. They rejoice also in the consciousness of pardon and acceptance. Through the service of the day of atonement just ended. But when the ransom of the Lord shall have been safely gathered where? Into the heavenly Canaan forever delivered from the bondage of the curse under which the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now, they will what? Rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Christ's great work of atonement for men will then have been completed or finished and their sins will have been forever blotted out. Question, when will the anti-typical feast of tabernacles be fulfilled in earth or in heaven? In heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters, someone says, well, that was the prophet. Does the Bible say the same thing? You see, everything that prophet says, guess what? The Bible says. And everything the Bible says, guess what? The prophet says, do you believe that? Well, then you're almost a seventh Adventist. Look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 7. What book did I say? Revelation 7. Look what the Bible says in Revelation 7. All books of the Bible meet and end in this book. In Revelation 7, look at verse 9. I want you to see this from your own Bible for yourself. It's so beautiful how the Bible fits together. From Genesis to Revelation. Look at Revelation 7 and verse 9. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Let's read verse 9 together. The Bible says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. What were they doing? Talk to me, somebody. They stood where? Before the throne. Question. Where were they, in earth or in heaven? Because the throne of God, Revelation 4 says, is in heaven. They're standing in heaven before the throne of God. Look what it says. Let's look at what the Bible says. It goes on to say, they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, How? clothed with robes. Now tell me something. What was in their hands? And palms were what? In their hands. Now question, why was palms in their hands? Talk to me somebody. Why was palms in their hand? Because they were rejoicing, celebrating the feast of tabernacles. So in the type the type said that they were going to be celebrating this feast with palms in their hand. That was a shadow. We see the real antitype, not on earth, but where? In heaven before the throne of God. The Bible is sweet, brothers and sisters. You see that if we didn't understand the sanctuary, we would just think they were walking around with palms in their hands, not understanding they were celebrating the last great feast and the plan of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you remember now? Now, look at how all this fits together. The Bible goes on to say in verse, uh, in verse 10, was it a day of rejoicing with his palms in the hand? A day of rejoicing, yes or no? The Bible says, and they cry with a loud voice saying, salvation unto our God, which sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb. They were singing the song of the Lamb that they made it over. They're rejoicing. Why? Because they're saved by the blood of Jesus. In fact, the, 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 the elders came and said, where did they come from? And the Bible says in verse 14, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said unto me, These are they which came out of what? Great tribulation. Before human beings became extinct in that time of tribulation, they were delivered out of that time. It says they came, from, uh, they came out with great tribulation and had washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him how? Day and night in his temple. And he, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell where? Among them. My brothers and sisters, we see the antitypical feast of tabernacles celebrated in heaven. After the harvest, after Jesus takes us to heaven at the end of the world and the harvest of the second coming, it's after that. It's celebrated with palm branches, a day of rejoicing. Question, it says that it was the uh, dwelt in booze and temporary dwelling. Now question, when we go to heaven, 
Are we going to have a temporary dwelling in heaven, yes or no? Oh, yes, we are. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that we don't actually live in heaven? Do you know that we're only going to be in heaven for a temporary period of time? We're only going to be in heaven, guess how long? We're going to be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Guess how long? A thousand years. It's our temporary dwelling. Our real home is not in heaven. Guess where our real home is? On the earth. You know, remember after a thousand years of us being in heaven celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, Satan comes about the camp of the saints, that temporary camping dwelling place. And then fire comes out of heaven, destroys him. And then what happens after that? Go to Revelation 21. Go to Revelation 21. What happens after that thousand year period when Satan and sinners are destroyed? What happens after that? You remember? Go to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. And look what it says in verse, in verse 7. In Revelation 20 verse 7. Let's read that together. Revelation 20 verse 7. It says, and when the thousand years are what? expired, Satan shall be loosed where? Out of his prison. Verse 8. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Verse 9. And they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. This was their temporary dwelling place. But then guess what happens? It says, and the beloved city and fire came down from God when? Out of heaven and devoured them. That same fire destroys the new heaven and the new, uh, excuse me, the, the, the old heaven and the old earth, and then something happens. Go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And verse 1, Revelation 21 verse 1 says, and I saw, what everybody, a what? New heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Why? It was passed away by the, the great noise and the burning up of the melting of the elements, and there was no more sea. Well, then what happens? After God destroys the first heaven and the first earth, he makes a new heaven and he makes a new earth. And then guess what? He causes our home to be here, not temporary, but our permanent home is going to be in the dwelling place on this earth. Do you know after 7,000 years, we're going to be exactly where we were before sin ever started. Eden lost is going to be Eden regained and Eden restored and it's going to happen on time. Verse 2 says, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down where? From God, out of heaven. God is going to move heaven from heaven down to this earth. It says, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3 says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven say, behold, the tabernacle of God is where? With men. And they shall dwell with them and they and he shall dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and God will be their what he'll be our God my brothers and sisters God is going to transfer his home from heaven to this earth and in 7,000 years we're going to be in the exact same place before sin ever entered this world now my brothers and sisters I call that the plan of redemption this is the event but now, brothers and sisters, this says these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the time. In like manner, the types which relate to the second advent. Now, the Passover related to the first advent. Unleavened bread related to the first advent. First fruits related to the first advent. Pentecost was connected with the first advent. But the Feast of Trumpet connected to the second advent. The Day of Atonement connected to the second advent. And the Feast of Tabernacles connected to the second advent. So these types, the fall types, which relate to the second advent, not might, but what? Must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. So the question would be, what is the time? In the symbolic service. Is that a good question? Yes or no? Because in that symbolic question, what is the time pointed out in the symbolic service? We're going to tell us tonight. We won't finish tonight, but we're going to introduce it tonight. Now look what it says. What was that time pointed out? Inspiration tells in the exact time pointed out in the symbolic service because it must be fulfilled on time. Now before I tell you what it is, if heaven works on a special number, do you think that perhaps that number is the number that heaven works off of? Are you understand what I'm telling you? What number does heaven work off of? Talk to me, somebody. It works off seven. But you remember now, I have the first six down here. Why? Because the first six feasts happen on earth. 
But the seventh feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, doesn't happen on earth. It happens where? In heaven. We prove that from the Word of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, this has to happen on time. This compacted prophecy of cycles of seven. And I'm going to tell you that the seventh feast must end. Listen to me carefully. The seventh feast must end by the seventh thousand years because God finishes everything in sevens. So if the seventh feast must end in the 7,000 years, I wonder when the sixth feast must end. Now, how long are we going to be in the Feast of Tabernacles? How long are we going to be in heaven? How long in heaven? So that means that a thousand years is going to be here. So then how much time are we going to be on this earth? How much time on the earth? 6,000. So now my brothers and sisters, the sixth feast must end no later than 6,000 years. So that the seventh feast can begin on time and then what? End on time. See, if we begin on time, we can end on time. And so now my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us, great controversy, 659 and 660, it says, for 6,000 years, Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to tremble. He has made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, and he opened not the house of his prisoners for how long? Talk to me, somebody. For what? 6,000 years, his prison house has received God's people, and he would have held them captive. He would have held them captive how long? Forever. But Christ had broken his bonds and set the prisoners free. Question. Satan would have held God's people prisoners for 6,000 years, but Christ stopped him. What was the prison house? We looked at it last night. What was the prison house? What broke the bonds of the grave of the prison house? What advent does that? Because at the second advent, what happens? When Jesus comes the second time, he comes with a shout. Am I right? With the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ do what? Rise. So at the, so at the second coming of Jesus, when that takes place, the graves will be opened up. The resurrection will take place. And then, brothers and sisters, we will be taken to heaven for the Feast of Tabernacles for a thousand years. Then what did they say? Next paragraph, for a thousand years. While we're celebrating the tabernacles up there, judging uh, 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 those who didn't make it, Satan will be wandering to and fro where? In the desolate earth to behold the results of his rebellion against the law of God. But after the end of the thousand years, Satan destroy sin and sinners. And 6,000 plus 1,000 equals 7,000. And the plan of redemption will come to an end at the end of the 7,000 years. And guess what? Eternity in the past will give way to eternity in the future. And we will live with Christ forever. Amen. And guess what? We'll live happily ever after. And that's not a fairy tale. That's the story of redemption. But in order to be there, we must have this experience with Jesus. Now, as we close tonight, we have to begin to understand as we get ready to close, this says 7,000 years. Now, my question is, does the Bible tell us the same thing? Yes or no? Does the Bible tell us, we see the prophet tells us, 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven, 7,000 years. We see that the last generation will come to an end. We see that the generation that comes to the end of the day of atonement will bring us all of this. But does the Bible tell us the same thing? Yes or no? We're going to close on this. Let's go in the Bible. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, show us that, Father, the time of our sojourn on this earth is about to end, that that 6,000-year limit is almost here, and that, Father, if ever there was a time to get to know you, the time is now. Help us to get ready without delay. Bless us in these last few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go in our Bibles to Isaiah 46. What book did I say? We're going to Isaiah, the 46th chapter. I want you to see this for yourself. Please write these texts down. Circle them so that you can see that whatever that prophet says, the Bible says, see, all Seventh-day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. We don't have to make up one word. All we have to do is let the Bible explain itself line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, and we're trying to understand how do we know that the earth has 7,000 years, 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven, and a total of 7,000 years. How do we know that? Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 46. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 9, let's read this together. We already know that this verse is explaining the plan of redemption. Every verse in the Bible is trying to unfold this. We have the key. 
And Isaiah 46, notice what it says beginning in verse 9. Are you there? Amen? Let's read verse 9 together. The Bible says in verse 9, remember the what? Former things of old. That's history. For I am God and there is what? None else. I am God and there is none like me. God said there's nobody like him. Brothers and sisters, do you know there's nobody like Jesus? And one of the things that shows us this, there are many things, but one thing is, is brought to view in verse 10. And verse 10, it says, how are there none like God? He says in verse 10, what does God do? He does what? Talk to me, somebody. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So the Bible said, none is like me. Verse 9 and 10, verse 10 says, what does he do? He declares the end from the beginning. So my brothers and sisters, that tells me if God declares the end from the beginning, if I want to know something about the end of time, all I've got to do is look at the beginning of time because God declares the end when? He declares the end from the beginning. So if there's something about the beginning of time that teaches me about the end of time. Let's go to the beginning of time. What book in the Bible would I go to for the beginning? Revelation takes me to the end. What book takes me to the beginning? Genesis. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Now understand what we're doing. We're trying to understand the history of the world. We see that Isaiah says that God knows the former things are history. And we see that God said there's none like me. God says that one of the ways that you know there's nobody like me is because what I do, I declare the end from the beginning. So then we're going now to see the beginning of time because there's something about the beginning of time that declares to us about the end of time. Now my question is, how did God start the beginning of time? Did he start it with 10 days? Did he start it with three days? How did God start the beginning of time? Talk to me somebody. God started the beginning of time with how many days? He started the beginning of time with seven days. Now, my brothers and sisters, there's something important about this. I mean, think about it. If God is declaring the end from the beginning, there's something about these first seven days that has to do with the end of time. In Genesis 1, you remember how the day started? In Genesis 1, verse 1, you know the text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Verse 3 says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And, and, and what happened? There was light. And then it says later on that evening and morning were the first day, and then the second day, and then the third day. But what was the last day in that first week span? What was the last day? Talk to me, somebody. In Genesis chapter 2, look what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 2, the Bible tells us. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, thus... The heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So we see that God is now finishing something. Now, notice as God finishes the heaven and earth. Now, this is the beginning of time. But God is declaring the end from the beginning. Now, the Bible says in verse 2, what day did he finish everything on? What day did he finish creation and everything on? It says in verse 2, and on the seventh day, God did what? Ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed, not the first or second or third. Verse 3 says, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why? Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So God finished creation, everything finished on the seventh day. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want us to understand something. That means that from the, the, the beginning of time, seven was a number that identified when something was going to finish. It was the finishing number, the number that everything was going to end on. The last number was seven. Now, question, could God have made a 10-day week? Yes or no? Why did he not make a 10-day week? Because everything that God was doing, he was teaching us something. God was giving us a parable. God didn't just start giving parables when he came on the earth. Jesus is the, is the same yesterday and today and forever. Just as he used natural parables when he was on the earth yesterday, he's doing the same thing. God, in giving man seven days, was trying to teach us something. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, let's see what he was trying to teach us. God was trying to teach us something about himself. How do I know that? How many days does man have to do all of his work? How many days does man have to do all his work? Man has only six days to do his work. Am I right? I want you to think about this now. Now, this says in the book Child Guidance 103, from the first dawn of reason, the human mind should become intelligent in regard to the what? Physical structure. Here, Jehovah in the man, in the physical structure, has given a what? What's that word? He has given a what? Specimen of himself, for man was made in the? Now, does the Bible say that, yes or no? In Genesis 1.26, it says, God made, and God said, let us make man, how? In our image, after our likeness. Verse 27 said, God created man in his own image. Now, think about this for a moment. That means then, if we want to know something about God, all we have to do is look at man. If we want to know something about God, we have to look at man. Why? Because man was created in the image of So man gives us a small picture, not a big picture, but a small picture of what God is like because man was made in his image and in his likeness. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Now, that is a specimen. Now, anybody in the medical field in this room, anybody in the medical field here in this room tonight? Anybody in the medical field? I don't see anybody in the medical field. Now, have you ever had your blood taken from you? Anybody ever had their blood taken from them? Maybe you've given it uh, to the Red Cross, or maybe you've given it to someone before, and when they draw your blood, do you know what you call the drawing of blood in the medical field? You know what you call that? The official name for that blood draw is called a specimen. It's a specimen. Now, that blood becomes a specimen. Now, I want to ask you a question. How much of that specimen do you need to understand all of the blood? Does a man have to take all of your blood in order to understand how good your blood is? If he did, you'd be dead. Am I right? <laughs> So the man only takes a small amount of blood to understand something about the larger amount of blood in the human body. Am I right? So a specimen is something smaller that gives us understanding of something larger. Man is smaller than God, but he gives us an understanding of something about God that is much bigger. Does it make sense to us? So if I want to understand God, all I got to do is look at his specimen and look at man. So if I look at how much time man has, I'm really seeing a specimen of how much time God has. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Do you understand? Yes or no? Now, question. How much time does does man have? Go to Exodus. What book did I say? In Exodus 20, we know the Bible is explaining the plan of redemption. The Bible is explaining the plan of redemption. Every verse in the Bible is trying to unfold this. In Exodus chapter 20, in the fourth commandment, God explains to us how much time man has. And by learning how much time man has, we understand something about God because man was made in the image of God. Now look what the Bible says in Exodus 20. You know the text, but I want us to read it from the Bible so that we don't miss any word. In Exodus chapter 20, look what the Bible says beginning in verse 8. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Let's read, uh, let's read that together. Exodus 20, beginning in verse, beginning in verse uh, uh, 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? Six days shalt thou labor and do how much? All thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do how much? Any work thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. So we can see clearly that man has six days to work and what else? One day to rest. And six plus one equals what? Seven. Now, someone says, well, that's man. But remember... Man was made in the image of God. Now, though man is smaller, we know then that God has six days to finish his work, one day the rest, but not that small. If we could find out the scale of what a day of man is like with God, then we would see the picture of how many days that God has. God has a bigger day than us because he's a bigger man. But yet, it's still to scale. You ever seen a map before, and they tell you that one inch represents 100 miles or 1,000 miles when you get the scale? The Bible allows us to see that, 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 that man has six days, one the rest, meaning God has six days, but there's a scale to that. And the Bible gives us the scale in not only creation, but in redemption. What is the scale for, for God? Go to Second Peter. What book did I say? 
If we could find out what a day is like with the Lord, then we can find out how much time God has. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In 2 Peter chapter 3, notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 3, notice what the Bible says, 2 Peter 3 and verse 3. Let's read that together. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 3, it says, knowing this first, that there shall come in what days? In the last days, scoffers walking after their own lusts, verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. God takes us back to the beginning of creation and then is getting ready to give us a scale in which we can see the beginning of time to the end of time. Look what the Bible goes on to say. In verse 5 it says, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What event is it talking about? It's talking about what? The flood. The Bible says in verse 7, going on to say, it goes on to say in verse 6, verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water did what? Perished. Verse 7 says, but the heavens and the earth which are now by that same word are kept in store and are reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of what type of men? What type of men? Ungodly men. Now the Bible says, I'm going to tell you how long the earth is going to be reserved. How long is it going to be reserved? All we have to do is look at the scale. In verse 8 it says, let's read this together in verse 8. It says, Beloved, be not ignorant of what? This one thing. If you forgot everything else tonight, don't forget this. It said, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So that if man was made in the image of God, how long does man have? How long does man have? Six days to do all his work, one day to rest. Then if man is made in the image of God, just in a smaller picture, how much time does God have? If man has six days to the Lord, a day is as a thousand years. That means that God has 6,000 years to do his work of redemption. And one day to rest, what is that one day? One day represents what? 1,000 years, and that's why in heaven we're there. How long? 1,000 years. That's that one-day period. And 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? 7,000. So now, my brothers and sisters, that means that the work of redemption, he has to finish it in 6,000 years. Is the Bible clear, brothers and sisters? Now, my brothers and sisters, that means if you can count the, if you can count the seven, you can find out the end of this world. 6,000 plus 1,000 equals 7,000. You're going to find out that this is something called the great week of time. Can you count to seven? Count with me. One, two, what else? Seven. Here's that great week of time. 7,000 years. Each day represents 1,000 years. Now, my brothers and sisters, in the first 1,000 years, Eden was lost. At the end of this 7,000 years, Eden will be restored. 6,000 years of work, 1,000 years of rest. We looked at the text. We saw many of those texts. Now, my brothers and sisters, after 4,000 years, something happened. It was God's purpose to place things on an eternal basis of security. I'm going to pass on that. This says, Desire of Ages 652, Christ was standing at the point of transition between two economies and their two great festivals. He, the spotless Lamb of God, was about to present himself as a sin offering. When did he do that? In Passover, 31 AD, when he died on the cross. It says, he, the spotless lamb of God, was about to present himself as a sin offering that he would thus bring to an end the system of types or shadows and ceremonies that for how long? I can't hear you. How long? For 4,000 years had pointed to his death. So when Jesus died on the cross, about how much time of human history had passed off the scene when Jesus died on the cross? About how much time? About 4,000 years. Then, brothers and sisters, the cross took place. Then how much time, basically, will we have left after the cross? About how much time after the cross? About 2,000, because 4,000 and 2,000 equals what? 6,000. And then we will be in the time of the, of the limit of the world, the coming of, the, of Christ, which is the uh, ends at the Day of Atonement. And then the Feast of Tabernacles will take us in heaven for how long? How long? A thousand years. And then Eden lost will become Eden what? Restored. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's going to happen. But at the 4,000 years of human history, Jesus comes on the earth. Now, you've got to understand why he came to the earth as well. Now, what day would it be? What day would the 4,000 years of human history be? What day would it be that he came? What day would that be? Think about it now. 
First thousand years will be what? Sunday. The second thousand years will be what? Monday. The third thousand years will be what? Tuesday. The third, fourth thousand years will be what? Wednesday. The fifth thousand years will be what? Thursday. Six thousand years will be what? Friday. And when the sun sets on Friday, Jesus comes back. Now, do you know that every Sabbath is a type of the second coming of Jesus Christ? And if we're not ready for the Sabbath when it comes, we'll never be ready for Jesus when he comes. And we're getting tests every week whether we're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Now, if we fail every week, do you think we're going to be ready at the final test? Now, my brothers and sisters, as a church, normally, what times do we meet together in order to celebrate as a congregation? What time do we meet together? We meet together on Sabbath, but then what time in the middle of the week do we come together? Talk to me, somebody. We come for Wednesday night prayer meeting. Do you know that Jesus came to the earth to conduct earth's Wednesday night prayer meeting? Ah, you missed it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Jesus came on Wednesday, as it were, after the 4,000 year period to conduct the service for the great week of time, and then he leaves the earth after that 4,000 years, goes back to heaven in the resurrection, and he's not going to come back again until when is the next time after Wednesday, generally, does the church come back together? Friday, it used to be that the old Adventists came together for a Vesper service on Friday evening. And guess what? Jesus is going to come down on Friday at sundown service, meaning at the end of six, Jesus is coming back. In order for Jesus to come back on time, that means that by the end of the sixth feast or the 6,000 years, he has to be here by that time so that we can be in heaven for how long? How long? A thousand years. So then, my brothers and sisters, the question is, as we close, the question is this. In 2024, how close are we to that 6,000-year limit? You understand what I'm telling you? Do you want to know? If I tell you tonight, you might be afraid to come back tomorrow night. Do you want to know how close we are to it? Because remember, this far and no further. I wonder... What if it were to reach the same time frame that the wise men and thinking men have said? Then the thinking men and the prophets would have told us the same thing. There would be time for it to take place. Do you want to know, yes or no? Yes. Now, your, your, your yes says sounds very weak. You've got to say it a little stronger than that. Do you want to know, yes or no? Yes. I want to tell you, but my time is gone. <laughs> no, sir. No, ma'am. But we're going to find out. Now, but in closing, I want to give us this. I want to give us this in closing. I'm going to pass on this. I want to give us this in closing. Now, look at this now. Inspiration says, in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the, not might, it must be fulfilled at time. And the time is 6,000. So it has to be fulfilled at 6,000. It has to happen on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. Do you know what event actually brings the second coming in type? Do you remember on the Day of Atonement, the priest goes where? What happens on the Day of Atonement? And on the Day of Atonement, the priest goes into the what place? What place? Not the outer court, not the holy place, but he goes into the most holy place. He goes inside the most holy place. Now, the most holy place is in heaven. Am I right? The outer court is outside of heaven. Where is that? Where is the outer court? On the earth. So the antitypical outer court is the earth. The antitypical sanctuary is in heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that on the Day of Atonement, at the end of the Day of Atonement, what does the priest do? He leaves the most holy place and comes back to the outer court. Am I right? Now, when he leaves the most holy place, the most holy place is in heaven. When he comes at the end of the Day of Atonement back to the outer court, that's him leaving heaven, coming to the earth. What do we call that at the end of the Day of Atonement? We call that event the second coming of Jesus. So the second coming of Christ is typified at the end of the day of atonement when the priest comes out of the most holy place, which means he has to come out on, did, was he born on time? Jesus died on time. He resurrected on time. He went into the most holy, uh, the holy place on time. He went into the most holy place on time, and he must come out of the most holy place on time. And that time is 6,000 years. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to show you that we have but a few short months to a few short years at the most before this takes place. Now, my brothers and sisters, if this was getting ready to happen, we can see that the earth is waxing old how? Like a what? 
Now, I want to ask you a question. If we could test this. Now, an engine, look at a car engine. Let's look at a car engine. A car engine, does it last forever or does it have a limit? Now, how long does the average gasoline car engine last by way of miles? Do you know that if you study, the mechanics say that it lasts 200,000 miles. If you treat it right, 200,000 miles. Now, my brother says they say it's an average of 10 years. Now, if I got to 100,000 miles based on the manufacturer, I treat the car right, I'm not yet at the limit. But if I get to 199,000 miles, I've come to a what? Limit. Now, how do I know when I'm getting ready to reach the limit of something? What would happen in a car if I'm getting ready to reach the age of its limit? The things begin to start failing. Am I right? The engine begins to start failing. The transmission begins to start going bad. Now, I want to ask you a question. Then if the earth is getting ready to reach its limit, what would start happening to the political systems of the earth? It would start failing. What would happen to the economic system? Start failing. What would happen to the social system? Start failing. What would happen to the environmental system? Start what? And the world sees that it's getting ready to happen now. Why? Because the limit is almost reached. My brothers and sisters, if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. I want to ask the question. If there's someone here tonight says, Lord, I see the handwriting on the wall. I see that we're coming there. The, the, what the thinking men say is the same as the Bible says. I want to trace it now. But Lord, what I need now is a friendship with you such as I've never had before. And guess what it's going to take? It takes what? Time. Are you willing to give Jesus your time tonight? To give him your heart tonight? To give him your life tonight so that he can work in us a radical change. Is there someone like that here tonight that says, Lord, I want to make a decision tonight that no matter what it costs, I want to give you my heart. Praise God. Tonight as we close, I want to give you something. We need to be praying tonight. We need to be praying tonight, Lord, whatever is in my heart that is keeping me from a relationship with Jesus, show me what it is so that I can put it down so that nothing will be between my soul and the Savior. Isn't that your desire tonight? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the handwriting is on the wall. We see clearly that the end of all things at hand that the Feast of Tabernacles will be fulfilled not on earth but in heaven during the thousand-year period. And Father, that last 7,000-year period has to start on time in order for you to finish on time. And just as you finished creation in seven days, you declared the end from the beginning and you showed us that you would do it not in seven literal days but for you in 7,000 years. 6,000 years with the work of redemption on earth, 1,000, we can rest with you in heaven, and then Eden lost will become Eden restored. And Father, we see that right now in 2024, we are approaching the end of this 6,000 years, and the limit is almost reached. We see everything failing now, and it begins to make sense. Why is the world failing? Why is the climate changing? Why is the political, economic, social, and environmental system collapsing? Because the limit is almost reached. The earth is waxing old like a garment. And Father, you're trying to tell us, please wake up. And our greatest need is a friendship with you, dear God. I pause the prayer. Someone says, Lord, please help me. Just raise your hand. You're saying, Lord, help me tonight. You may be on the internet. You may be here in this room, but you're saying, Lord, I need help. You know that when Jesus comes back, everyone will wish they were ready. But at that time, many who play games with God are going to cry and scream and kick and fight, gnawing and gnashing, but it's going to be too late then. But tonight, it's not too late. Tonight, we can say, Lord, seal my conviction with Jesus. Heavenly Father, you see every lifted hand. I'm lifting mine, not because I'm preaching. I'm lifting mine, Lord, because I want to be ready to meet you. I want my family to be ready. I want everyone under the sound of my voice to be ready. I pray that every careless soul, if there's any soul here that is not making a decision tonight, I pray that you will not let us sleep tonight, that you will give us dreams, that you will give us conviction that would deepen in our hearts to tell us if ever that we're going to get ready, do it now before it is everlasting too late. And so, Father, please, don't just let my words be there. Let the Holy Spirit scream with a loud cry. 
so that we can be ready to meet you in peace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for what you did tonight. We felt your presence, and we want to say thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Amen. Are you happy you're here tonight? Yes. Did you learn anything tonight? Do you want some more? Yes. Tomorrow night, we're going further. We're going to see where we are in this 6,000-year period and what we need to be doing to get ready. But you have to have some homework. Before you leave, don't get your homework. You Somebody say, oh, please, give me homework. Give me homework. <laughs> Let me give you the homework. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter what? Now, I couldn't be a good teacher without giving homework. I know you want this homework. Leviticus, the 16th chapter, please. The whole chapter is talking about the Day of Atonement. We've got to understand the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16, and then I want you to read in, the, in Great Controversy, page 655 through 661. 655 through 661. It's the chapter, the desolation of the earth. The desolation of the earth. But it's the last few pages of that chapter. Great Controversy 655, 661. What was the homework? Leviticus chapter what? 16. Whole chapter. And Great Controversy chapter, uh, chapter uh, I believe it's 41, Desolation of the Earth, and it's page 655 through 661. Someone says, but minister, I don't have enough time to do that homework. Well, yes, you do, because I gave you a challenge. No television. Amen? So now you have all the time in the world. What do you say? Amen. You may consider yourself dismissed as we get ready to leave. You may consider yourself dismissed. Let's pray for each other. I'll see you tomorrow night. What time? 969. At first, this night is supposed to be 30 seconds. It's going to be 69 and zero seconds. Amen? Amen. Let's pray for each other. I'll see you tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, may God bless you. You may consider yourself dismissed.